Welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is a recently completed Canadian Frailty Priority Setting Project. I'm just going to do a quick review of some of the news and events around CFN and some housekeeping details. Um, in today's webinar, we will have a Q&A following today's presentation. So if you could please submit your questions online during the presentation, we'd really appreciate that. And we'll try to get to as many as we can today. Uh, Perry Kim, our manager of research, will host the Q&A today. And just as a reminder, at the end, um, before you sign off, a survey will pop up on your screen and it provides everyone the opportunity to uh, give feedback to our presenters as well as to ourselves to uh, hopefully improve the webinar series. The webinar slides and the video will be available for viewing online on our website and you can see the URL there. Um, between 24 and 48 hours and actually we usually get them up earlier but that's just in case we don't. Um, we have a number of webinars posted on our website uh, so that you could register now and the next few webinars coming up are uh, November 22nd introducing electronic quality of life assessment in hospital palliative care and then on Wednesday, December 6th, we have another one exploring the preferences of older Canadians living with frailty for aspects of inpatient care. And on Wednesday, January 10th, identifying older patients at high risk of poor outcomes after joint replacement surgery. So hope that you have some time today to go register. Um, we also have a Catalyst grant competition in process. Uh, this competition addresses ongoing concerns of polypharmacy and related medication issues in older Canadians living with frailty. Um, this is uh, a competition presented with both CIHR and New Brunswick Health Research Foundation. And the applications for those who submitted an intent to apply uh, are due on November 13th by 5 o'clock, which is less than a week away. Um, if you need more details, please visit our website and you'll see the URL there um, and it will give you more information. Uh, we also have, as a result of today's uh, webinar uh, and project completion, a new funding opportunity coming up. Um, this competition will be based on the results that are presented today and we are currently seeking partner organizations interested in co-funding this opportunity. Uh, we likely will get this out in the next month and the, it will be com <laughs> widely communicated to our network. So please continue to visit our website for any updates on our competition and the dates. And if you know of any organizations that would like to be part of this competition, uh, please let us know so we can follow up with uh, any organization that wishes to be part of this um, opportunity. Very unique opportunity, I'd say. And so now we will start our presentation and I'll introduce our two presenters today. We have Catherine Magilton. Uh, she is the senior scientist at the Toronto Rehab Institution and she's an associate professor in the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. We also have Jennifer Bethel. She completed her PhD in epidemiology at Dalalana School of Public Health in 2012. Since 2015, she has been a postdoc researcher with Dr. Magilton at the Toronto Rehab Institute working on two priority setting partnerships. So Catherine, with that, please go ahead and start your presentation. Great. Thank you. Good. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we're going to be talking about the top 10 Canadian priorities for frailty research. And Jen and I are going to take turns um, because, first of all, you need to understand that uh, Jen did most of the heavy lifting. Um, <laughs> and so I want to make sure she's sharing in the glory. Um, Martine Puss is also uh, one of our collaborators. She's an associate professor at Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing. Her expertise is actually in frailty, and so she was a valuable team member. And Schroeder Sater was our HQP, and she's a third-year PhD candidate at the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing. Okay, so our outline today, slide two, is basically the context. We're going to talk a little bit about patient engagement, what James Lindelein is all about, the Canadian Frailty Network. Jen's then going to talk about the methods, 
I will talk about the, res the results. I'll do the big reveal. Mm -hmm. And then Jen's going to talk about next steps. So the context. As you're, I'm sure, all very well aware, especially for now you're writing grants in 2017, this is a big focus of, future, of the future. We really need to have more patient engagement in everything that we're doing. Um, so when we took this um, I guess grant on, and by the way, it was funded by the Canadian Frailty Network, um, we thought we better go by the definition, and what's out there is CHR has a definition of patient engagement, and basically it talks about it occurs when patients meaningfully and actively collaborate in the governance, priority setting, and conduct of research, as well as in knowledge translation. And so, of course, we took this to, uh, for the priority setting, we thought, wow, we need to get patients involved. And just for your information, they use patients meaning individuals with personal experience of a health issue and informal caregivers, including families and friends. And so, just there's a lovely uh, website you can go to if you need that definition. Patient engagement, why is it important? Well, I think there are the arguments, and we found a paper by Wilson that talks about methodologically. We feel that better, more relevant research, and it should assist with knowledge translation if they've been involved from the beginning. We feel, uh, and Wilson does, that there's greater impact as well with this research. And I think today, because there's so limited funding, uh, there probably is a moral and ethical reason just to really talk about where we should be and you're marking the scarce research funds. So what we did when we started this out, we actually thought, um, since research priorities are typically set by researchers, uh, less often involving other knowledge users, including patients, care providers, policy makers, we, we thought we better change the, the way things have been done in the past. And so actually we followed the methods of the James Lind Alliance to set the research priorities. And this James Linda Lyons is a nonprofit organization. It was established in 2004, uh, supported by the UK National Institute for Health Research. And it actually provided guidance on how to conduct the priority setting partnerships. There's several stages, and we're going to go through those stages, actually, Jen will, when we talk about the methods. Um, and it helps to bring patients, carers, and clinicians together to identify and prioritize unanswered questions in specific conditions or areas of healthcare for research. What's very important here, our researchers are not allowed to be involved because as you, you can imagine, we have our own biases and they don't want to make sure that our voice is not represented, uh, especially in the setting of priorities for research. To date, and if you go to their website, um, again, it's down at the bottom, you'll see that there's been about at least 50 uh, priority setting partnerships that have been conducted. Um, anywhere from things like kidney disease to acne, um, and we just finished one looking at uh, working with the Alzheimer's Society focus on dementia. So it's actually, a, I think, really, really quite wonderful to help sort of funding agencies, organizations prioritize what they should do research on. So as you know, or maybe you don't, in uh, February 2016, the Canadian Frailty Network launched a request for proposals to provide um, the Canadian Frailty Network with a list of patient-centered research priorities. And so uh, we put our name in the hat and we were successful. And this is what um, the results are of this work coming to you today. So Jen, I'm gonna turn it over to you to walk through the methods. Great, great. Um, so thanks, Kathy. And as Kathy mentioned, this was a James Lind Alliance priority setting partnership. So I'm gonna go through the methods of the JLA and specifically how we use them for this particular project relating to frailty. So at the outset, we established a steering group, and we had a fantastic steering group composed of clinicians, older adults, family members of frail older adults, and it was a, a fantastic group to work with. And I also want to point out our James Lind Alliance advisor, um, Catherine Cowan. So she's with the JLA from the UK, and she would join us on our calls just to make sure that we were upholding their principles of transparency and equal involvement, but also giving us practical advice on her vast experience with these types of projects um, for moving things forward. So this group of individuals worked with us, um, the research team, we can see our names also listed there. Uh, and we met monthly by phone between October 2016 and August 2017. And this steering group, really what they did was they advised and oversee, oversaw sorry, the project, but they were also involved in some of the actual tasks of the work, so the data processing, approaching, approaching partner organizations, and participating in the final workshop. So I'll get to all these 
uh, steps later on. But anyway, just to acknowledge our fantastic steering group that really uh, helped us from start to finish. Uh, and also, actually, as this is a patient engagement project, I'd also like to acknowledge some of the help that we had from older adults who were not researchers but engaged in this project with us. So as, through the steering group, we had uh, older adults help us with the governance, the conduct, and dissemination of the work itself. Uh, but also through this group at the University of Waterloo, the Seniors Helping as Research Partner and SHARP group, when we set out to create our survey, um, which I'll get to in a moment, they they sort of tested it with for us. So they, they met in person, they went through the survey, and actually gave us some really practical advice that we then turned around and sort of, I, I guess, essentially rewrote our survey um, based on their uh, input. So after establishing the partner, our story as a steering group, we invited partner organizations who at this point are uh, <laughs> too many to name right now, but you can see that this is a great, uh, great set of organizations, groups, societies, professional associations that represent or advocate for older adults or the clinicians who work with them. And so our partner organizations helped us uh, sort of get the survey out, nominate workshop, workshop participants, um, and ultimately will help us disseminate the results as well. So the next step, step as, uh, as you know, this project was really about getting research priorities from Canadians, is that we had to gather their questions about frailty. So we set the scope of the project and the questions that we asked for around care, support, and treatment of older adults living with frailty. And so we asked people, we asked Canadians um, across the country for their questions related to care, support, and treatment of older adults living with frailty. And we promoted this survey through our partner organizations we just listed. Uh, we put up some no local newspaper ads, and we had a mailing list of uh, older adults that we uh, was still, uh, facilitated through a group at McMaster University. And so we targeted this survey to older adults who are concerned about frailty, uh, older adults uh, who maybe don't have direct experience with frailty but are interested in the issue, friends, family, and caregivers, and health and social care providers who work with uh, older adults living with frailty. And so the survey was available in English and French online, and paper versions were also distributed, and it was open for just over four months. So. Um, sort of the spring, early summer of 2017. So in our survey, it's I think important to point out that how we define frailty to uh, our respondents. So, so obviously there's people with clinical experience of frailty, there's people with personal experience, and maybe their definitions or perceptions of frailty uh, are, are, don't overlap completely. So this is the definition that we used in our survey. It was based on the definition that was on the Canadian Frailty Network's website at the time. So we tried to sort of point out four key things about frailty. Number one, it's around physical, mental, and social functioning. Number two, it's a continuum going from fit to very frail. Number three, it's associated with age. And number four, this idea of uh, you know vulnerability to stressors. But we'll come back to this issue of what is frailty uh, later on in the presentation. So when we look at who responded to our survey, I should say we heard from 389 groups and individuals across the country, uh, people with lived experience, a great response from clinicians. Um, we collected other data as well about the, the respondents, but we're just going to present a few of the uh, variables or questions right now. Uh, you can see here it was mainly women who responded, fewer men, um, and a nice spread of, uh, of ages. And we had people from across the country respond, and perhaps not completely representative of the Canadian population by the distribution of province, but it's certainly a good number from, uh, from across the country. So those 389 uh, individuals or groups uh, sent us a whole bunch of questions about frailty. And when we reviewed them, we removed 
about 100 or sorry 152 because they were either out of scope or couldn't be formulated into a question and so the sort of thing that might be out of scope is how do I find services in my area or um, you know a general statement but without an actual question underlying the statement so the remaining 646, 647 questions were categorized, merged, and summarized. So when we did that, what we tried to do with each question was extract the, the PICO elements. So we tried to say, okay, are they talking about a specific population? Are they talking about a specific intervention or exposure or control or a specific outcome? And so we tried to extract each one of those from each question. Ultimately, I would say probably there was one question that had every single PICO element. Um, the rest would have maybe one or two, but it's, you know, we tried to get that out so that we could categorize the questions and then go on to merge them and summarize them into sort of what we call indicative questions that would um, essentially summarize the, the essence of these other questions. Um, so once we had those questions, we had 41, or sorry, we checked them against the research evidence. So we had an information specialist here at UHN help us with a literature search. So she looked for all the reviews published in the area of frailty between 2014 and 2017. And then we cross-checked that against our list of questions that we had extracted from the data. And ultimately this produced a list of 41 answered, unanswered questions about care, supportment, support and treatment of older adults living with frailty. So for our next step, to bring the list of questions down and start the prioritization process, we went back out to the people who responded to our initial survey. So at the end of the survey, we asked people, do you want to be involved in the next phase of the process? And if so, please give us your contact information. So we went back out to them with this list of 41 questions and ask them to identify their own personal top 10 so that we could then use a shorter list that would go out to, the, to go to our next phase of the prioritization. So this survey was available in English and French, online and paper, and it was open for about six weeks, so uh, late summer of this year. And so 146 groups and individuals across Canada responded. Now I just want to point out at this point that we looked at the data and we wanted to make sure that we represented people with lived experience, so older adults and caregivers, as, as well as we could as clinicians. So we stratified the top 20 list based on lived experience versus clinical experience to make sure that when we go to the next step of the prioritization, we actually represented both groups' priorities. And so ultimately, we ended up with 22 questions. The 21st was because it was tied with the 20th for uh, 20th spot, and the other one, we looked at the list of questions from the lived experience group, and we went down to their top 14, so their 14th ranked question, and added that to our list just to make sure we represented both uh, both groups well. Hopefully that makes sense. So the final phase, of the, or sorry, the final phase was we had a workshop here in Toronto. So 21 participants from across Canada, older adults, friends, family, and caregivers of older adults, and health and social care providers met, and we also had observers. Um, so myself and Kathy, Martine Schroeder, and some representatives from the Canadian Frailty Network to observe. We couldn't participate. We had to keep quiet in the uh, entire day. It was chaired by our JLA advisor who came over from the UK. It was a one-day meeting here in Toronto on September 26th, and through a series of small and large group discussions, uh, they took those 23 questions, discussed them, and agreed on a ranking. And just to point out that when we planned our workshop, we made sure it was accessible, close to public transit, we gave people help with travel and directions as required. So ultimately, at that workshop, we came to consensus, or they came to consensus, to produce the top 10 priorities for research on frailty. Okay, so the big reveal, and I think I just want to start off by saying this is our list, and not the list. Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes researchers come together and say, okay, these are what we think are the priorities, and we think that's important. But this was more for the from I think different voices of Canadians living with frailty. Um, so we just think 
there needs to be multiple voices to make sure the agenda moving forward is comprehensive. So this is where we, we started. Basically, people were quite concerned about the healthcare system. They felt that there was sort of, they wanted to know how we can have better integrated, coordinated care to meet health and social care needs. And I'm going to maybe just pause because it's probably easier if you just have a read. Um, but I want to maybe what I see is it's very, it's the very beginning, a quite large system issue they're dealing with, and I think continually sort of narrows down to more specific interventions. So I'll, I'll be quiet for maybe 30 seconds. <laughs> So of the researchers that are on the call, hopefully you're happy uh, that you might see some of your work fitting into some of these. Uh, for those that aren't, maybe you need to think about how might your research fit into some of these broader areas. You'll note they're not very prescriptive. They're not meant to be. Uh, so really, researchers are meant to sort of say, hmm, I've got an idea looking at uh, how to remain at home, um, because that's really what we're looking for at the end of the day is of a guide, but at the end of the day, it's the researcher that's going to develop the question to address these indicative questions. We need to mention this very big challenge, and really, we it was quite fascinating because there's a UK group looking at something similar, but it's multiple chronic conditions or multiple uh, multiple chronic conditions in over age 80 or something like okay. that. Okay, yeah. um, and we were speaking with them, and we had mentioned that we were going to be sending out a survey on frailty, to say, and they basically said, frailty? We don't even use that word here in the UK, and it was fascinating because our answer was very easy, and I'm going to thank the Canadian Frailty Network for this. I said, well, they're funding us, and they use frailty, so we're going to. <laughs> um, but that's probably not the best response necessarily because we were a bit concerned that People actually don't see themselves as frail. And I know, again, for most clinicians that are on the phone, you know this very well. Uh, there is a bit of a derogatory, you know, you think of someone that's frail and you don't want to be that person. So I think we have to uh, keep this in mind. It's a bit of a barrier, for sure, for participating in, in surveys and workshops, and we have some evidence of that. Uh, many who will, would meet the criteria for frailty, uh, the skills that we have in our minds as we're looking at the client in front of us, uh, they don't see themselves as frail even though we do. So um, I think that's actually a bit of a barrier and we really talked about this in our committee and again we had some great minds because a lot of our um, some researchers on our steering committee work in this area and they talked about things like maybe saying vulnerable, um, you know, where there are different terminal terms we could use and again this could be an interesting discussion afterwards. We're not 100% sure either. Just uh, to note though, I did actually um, have the privilege of bringing over a client from a nursing home and to the actual conference and actually had a fabulous discussion in the taxi ride over. And of course, we had, I, we had consented. I'd spoken to her before and we talked about frailty. And of course, the first thing she said is, I'm not frail. And it was really quite, again, wonderful how we, I mean, they talked about what we mean as frail. Sometimes you need a little bit of help. And she said, actually, I do need a little bit of help uh, getting up in the morning and getting dressed. I said, okay, well, it is a bit of a continuum. So sometimes people see that as maybe a little bit of of frailty. So it's actually, it was, um, again, highlighted how difficult this language is for persons that are frail. Go ahead, Jen, you're on. Great. Uh, so thinking about next steps, and ultimately, you know, we think about why we do this project or why we did this project, and it's I, to stimulate more research in these priority areas to ultimately improve the health and quality of life of older adults. So how do we how do we get there? How do we do this? And so how do we share these priorities and actually translate them into research? So you can look generally at how these priority setting partnerships have been used by others. So Kathy mentioned there's been, you know, more than 50 done um, around the world, or mostly in the UK and, and mostly in Canada in a, a variety of areas. So you can go to the James Lynn's Alliance website and see, okay, what have people done with these top 10 lists and how is it you know, how does it change the way research is being done? Uh, so, in particular, we, we can think about how research funding agencies now can take this information, these priorities, and turn them around into targeted calls or requests for proposals 
There's lots of examples of health charities running funding competitions based on topics identified by priority setting partnerships. And certainly you can see researchers now taking these priorities and writing grant applications and rationalizing, okay, it's an important problem because it's common, it's costly, and this particular topic is important to Canadians with a personal connection. And you can also see advocates taking these research priorities and you know, advocating for more research or, um, or, or working with government and policymakers to try and stimulate more research in these particular areas. But we are, of course, extremely fortunate to be working with the Canadian Frailty Network, who is already committed to using these priorities that we have uh, um, identified from this from this work and so you know, this is from their website and I think we'll hear more about it but uh, they're in fact call, uh, having a call for implementation and intervention projects related to the, um, the topics identified here so this is extremely exciting to see how these topics are now being translated into research. So we want to thank you and I wonder if maybe we should go back leave the top 10 mm -hmm. on, so if anyone has any questions, comments, uh, it might be useful for them just to have it in front of them again. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank you for your time, um, and we are more than interested in uh, hearing about any questions. I just want to also, something that I've forgotten to mention, uh, we were actually tracking what, where, um, during the process, who was responding, uh, the demographics of the population, and also the geographic locations. And in fact, at one point, we decided we thought uh, we would actually work with local newspapers. Remember that, Jess? So, we did, yeah. yeah. And I'm going to say there were targeted areas. We found somebody that would put uh, this advertising about the survey mm -hmm. in their newspapers in small towns. That's right. right. In, well, Canadian cities? in local papers, yeah, in Montreal, um, Edmonton, Vancouver, or no, sorry, Surrey. And Winnipeg. Yeah. Okay, so it was another strategy we used when we thought, oh, there seems to be a problem with uh, sort of the getting enough input from some of our persons with frailty and their caregivers. Okay, I think we're done, and we'd love to hear uh, any comments from the audience. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Catherine and Jennifer, for sharing your work today. And uh, I believe this is the first webinar in our CFN webinar series where they, someone used the James Lind Alliance approach. So, so that's good, and it'll probably generate a lot of questions today. And with that, Perry will begin the Q&A, and we'll try to combine similar questions to hopefully allow us to answer yeah. the majority of the questions today. And thanks for putting that top 10 up. I think great minds think alike as we were going to do the same, and it's, it's interesting to see, um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of information there. So, mm -hmm. Perry? Go ahead. Hi, Kathy. Hi, uh, Jennifer. <clears throat> We're waiting for some questions to come in, but uh, we do have a few. Uh, the first one is with respect to the 10 priorities, and, there, and the question is, um, are those priorities presented in order of importance? Yeah, they are. So the, at the workshop, I should say that the, when they ranked them, they ranked them number one was the number one priority all the way down to 22 being the the least important of those presented to them on the day. So yes, this is in rank order. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just curious, in terms of the uh, priorities, uh, were there any surprises in terms of what percolated to the top versus uh, ones that may have not made the top 10 from your point of view? This is both to Kathy and uh, Jennifer. Um, I guess for me, that what was interesting is probably a few weeks before the list came out, there was a call around pharmacology for polypharmacy, right, and how to reduce that. And I actually wondered if that was going to be one of uh, the priorities. And to me, that's an actually beautiful example of, you know, we think it's important as researchers. Obviously, you did, and I'm not sure actually how you choose your priorities, to be terribly honest, but that wasn't one of the top ten. Um, so, again, I just thought that was very interesting, and it's important to have different voices uh, speaking mm -hmm. for my priorities. What about you, Jen? Um, I wasn't totally surprised. I mean, I just was rereading a scoping review from David Hogan and his colleagues about mm -hmm. a CIHR workshop, and they talked specifically about some research priorities related to the acute care setting, so not as broad as 
what we were looking at, but there was a lot of overlap there. Um, so nothing too surprising. I guess I was somewhat surprised by number two, isolated old, older adults. But I think that really, uh, I think clinicians struggle with, um, from what I took from the conversations, it, it's, a, it's a real challenge day to day. Right, thank you. Um, with respect to, there's 10 listed or the top 10, there's a, clearly a, tw a 12 others that weren't listed. Are you going to provide those other 12 in your publication? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure that they'll go, we're going to, ideally the plan is to create a, a report mm -hmm. plus a peer-reviewed publication. And I think also on the James Lind Alliance website, so we can send that around, is that they list, they have all 50 priority setting partnerships that they've done. And so you could see the top 10 from everything from acne to preterm pre -term birth. So our intention is certainly to have the 22 ranked list on that website. And so I think it's important to know that, you know, it's not, these are, you know, number 11, where do we draw the line? These, they're all important, and certainly the having that list made public is, is going to be something that we will do because it is important. That's great. Um, I've got a few more questions coming in. Um, there's a question about uh, priority number one and six, and the question is, in Canada's multicultural context, an important challenge of language relates also to inclusiveness, to recognize diverse experience of all communities. Perhaps citizen engagement can help here, but question mark. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great idea. I mean, we were looking at very broadly sort of attitudes, knowledge, skills, and that to me is where the researcher can bring that beautiful lens to say, okay, what about diversity? I mean, this sounds like um, another lens that you can look at this because it is actually more complex. Um, when you don't have somebody that speaks English or that you're in a rural area for integrated care. So I actually would totally agree that that would maybe be a nice sub-question to ask within this. Um, and I know about communicating in hospitals if you don't speak the same language. What are we going to do about that? Um, so I actually think that's a fabulous idea and that's what the uniqueness of the researcher that's writing the grant can highlight that and say, you know, we're never going to get to a good healthcare system if we're not addressing uh, diversity. Right, I was thinking the same thing and looking at your priorities there. Number four, with respect to alternative models of housing and the multi-generational shared living, uh, that clearly speaks to probably, that's probably more relevant in terms of sort of the immigrant population that tends to have multi-generational uh, shared living than maybe uh, Western societies. Um, got a few more questions here, but uh, <clears throat> I want to ask you in terms of uh, the challenges with respect to working with older adults and, and in particular frail older adults. I know I was at the workshop, Kathy, and and, and uh, there were a number of citizens there, but you were working with, uh, you were closely working with one that was, I believe, in her in their 90s. And I was fairly, I was really impressed with the amount of work and amount of care you took in, in terms of trying to tease out the her thoughts and sort of help her articulate the thought, her thoughts. And I thought, you know, that was a one-on-one -on -one sort of uh, interaction you had with that uh, particular individual. And I'm, I'm curious your thoughts in terms of how one would even be able to scale that in terms of it being in inclusive of more than that number. Well, that's a fabulous question. And um, I have to tell you our cab ride over. I mean, we had met before in the nursing home. And it was more about, here's this what it's about. It was very fuzzy and, you know, it was, she didn't really understand, I think. So, but to be honest, what happened in the drive over, and again, part of it is we had, I'm not even sure she really remembered me, to be honest, when she saw me again. She kind of remembered the exercise. But doing things in the moment are incredibly important. So we actually had the luxury of having a cab drive over. So I was able to share with her the 22 questions. And kind of say to her, okay, here are the 22. Tell me what you think of these are sort of important, because that was our homework. The top three and the, and the bottom three. So I kind of went through them all, and she, she gave some beautiful, I think I, we have to publish this, um, on reasons why she didn't actually care about diet, for instance, which, you know, was, which was a hard one, to be honest, because we had someone advocating for diet. We know that's important, but she'd say things like, well, we have, where I'm at, uh, people that actually, this, I'm on the diet committee. That's what she said. Well, actually, so we're taking care of that. I'm telling them what we need, and they'll tell me about the cost of strawberries. So I have to back off sometimes. So she was very articulate what her needs were, um, and also what she thought needed to have happened. So when I got to the meeting, we also invited her daughter, 
And at one point I thought they would be together. And then I realized actually the daughter had a whole different set of priorities and she needed her time to kind of speak. So I just said, um, again, according to the James Linda Lyons, I could not speak, but I could speak on her behalf. And that's what I did as I, because she did at one point became very teary eyed because we were talking about, um, I think it might have been suicide when I came up and she had a, an experience with that. So we actually left. It is very labor intensive to get to be there and to advocate on someone's behalf. Um, so, Perry, I don't have a magic bullet. I think it's been listening, uh, sharing the stories that they were told, um, and and sort of just being there with her and trying to make sure um, I could state exactly what sh her issues were. And and being um, aware when there was too, she was too much, because that was also, she felt a bit overwhelmed by it all. So we had a little walk outside the hall for a while. We talked and we came back. Um, so the importance of, I guess, before an exercise, being uh, spending some time about what it's about would be useful, and um, and I'm not sure how to mass produce this. And I, mean, I think that's a very interesting point. I think um, it, patient engagement takes time, building relationships takes time, doing this well takes time. And I, I think those that's kind of the lesson that I learned. Jen? Yeah, I mean, just to say that it was <clears throat> she, it, the this individual at the workshop was a, a fabulous contributor, and I. I really appreciate Kathy's work, and as she said, I mean, to do this work, it's, you know, you have to some relationship building. You have to be flexible in your approach. One size does not fit all, um, and really think think <clears throat> think through the practical realities of, you know, trying to organize. We, you know, organize the transportation, and there was a last minute crisis about the road being closed, and so organizing wheelchairs. So it wasn't, you know, it's. It's, it's not easy. You have to plan for it from the beginning. You have to budget for it. You have to build the relationships. Um, but yeah, not, no easy answers. Yeah, and I have to agree with, with what the approach you're using. We have a, uh, all our committees have citizens to be representative on our committees, and we have 10 committees. And to ensure that we have people, uh, older Canadians living with frailty on our committees, it is a challenge, but it's it's worth the uh, extra effort. But I like what you said. It it does require a lot more effort, but I think you get a lot more back. Absolutely. Well, I think the key was getting the information just prior to the meeting, so she remembered it. And then when I got to the meeting, and she then forgot the comment, I advocated. So I'd say, oh, by the way, this is what you said. And she goes, oh, of course. And then she asked a little story. Yeah. So actually, I think that's the, the nuance. Maybe before going into the meetings with person sort of saying, what are your opinions? And then when you're in the meeting, if they don't really remember them, you say, actually, this is what you said. Mm -hmm. You know, just to help remind them. That might work. Yeah, I thought that was great, in fact, uh, that you had notes and you were reminding her of what she had said prior to uh, as you uh, came down from the cab or maybe the subway ride. Um, just a related question to an earlier comment uh, with respect to polypharmacy and medication optimization. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, there's a, it's not a tough question, but uh, so the question is, could number nine, priority number nine, include appropriate treatments with medication or was it intended to exclude treatments related to drugs? I, no, it was, it's intended to be broad. So this is, you know, questions came up making decisions about surgery, making decisions about chemotherapy, making decisions about medical management. So this is, is, is intentionally broad. And I think, again, as Kathy mentioned, these are sort of thematic. So someone could say, okay, I'm going to answer this question using technology. And someone else is going to say, I'm going to answer this question using a nursing intervention. So it's, it's they're meant, yeah. Anyway, sorry, long answer, but yes, no, it's inclusive. And so it could be included in an app, but just of interest, there actually were, I think, two very specific to polypharmacy, um, mm -hmm. and they were not, oh, you probably have them in front of you. Uh, how can prescribing be optimized for frail older adults? That was not on their top 10. Um, and also, what are effective approaches for de-prescribing? So, you know, these were very specific questions, and again, we need to go back, but my guess is you can even tell by de-prescribing. These are probably clinicians that were asking these questions because that's probably, you know, I know we kind of, but I don't know. We have to go yeah. back and look at that because we, we actually can track everything. So we could probably go back and tell you that I'm not sure we want to ever do this, but uh, <laughs> and if, for instance, question seven, you know, 30% were persons uh, living with disease, you know, 25 persons that, you know, spoke to this issue uh, were 
partners, caregivers, right? Right. And but ultimately, when they came to the top ten, this is these are shared priorities. So the mm -hmm. the, the, peop, the older adults, there was family members, there was clinicians all in the room. So when it came time to rank in these twenty two questions, it, they're shared priorities, not specific to either either group. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions. Uh, there's a question, how were the participants for the in-person prioritizing sessions selected? I believe you did sort of go through some of that, but if you could elaborate. Yeah, a lot of them came via partner organizations, um, and some of them came via our steering groups. So when we had, I should have actually mentioned earlier, is that when we had the, the workshop, is to participate in the workshop, you had to be either someone with lived experience, so an older adult or a family member, or a clinician or working actively clinically. So researchers, people who work strictly in research, you couldn't participate. You could watch, but you couldn't open your mouth. So anyway, all this to say, most of our workshop participants came via partner organizations. Some came through the steering group as well. Great, thank you. Um, I noticed on slide 13 you, you showed you had uh, percentages of responses from different um, categories of responders, if you will. So it's more it's kind of like demographics. 21% uh, 21, 21 of uh, responses were from uh, partner, relative, or friends of, of a frail older adult. And then you had other categories of just older adults and so forth. Did you ever look at the responses and see if, if different categories or different groups responded differently in terms of the priorities? We, we did not really. I mean, when I, I mentioned that when we did the interim prioritization, so when we said, okay, which of these 41 questions are going ahead to the workshop for the ultimate top 10, we did stratify. So we, because we, we were very conscious of making sure that the lived experience group was not underrepresented. And it, in fact, their top 20 was, you know, I wouldn't say identical, but had a huge overlap with the top 20 of the clinicians. So at that point, we did stratify and look at the two separately. But otherwise, I mean, trying to keep this as a shared priority setting process, um, we could, but we, we didn't. Right, fair enough. Um, I think we're getting to the end of our questions. I had a couple of last questions, um, one of which is, I, I may have missed this, but uh, the survey, was it strictly done in Canada? In other words, was the survey sent out to only Canadian um, uh, individuals? It was. Um, at some point in the preamble, we said you have to be or you have to live in Canada to take part or something like that, but we didn't track IP addresses and exclude people who was postmarked from the US or anywhere else. So, I mean, we did ask strictly for Canadians, um, and it is a Canadian frailty priority setting partnership, and they told us which province they lived in. So, there wasn't any. Um, way of means of excluding them, but we were pretty clear that that was who we were open to. Great, uh, thank you. Um, the last question I have, and, and um, others may have, which is a, a simple question, is um, who exactly is James Lind? <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> Are you ready? Um, I'll try and keep it brief. But James Lind was a naval surgeon around circa, I think, around 1600, and he was working on board the ships, obviously, as a naval surgeon, and so at the time, more sailors were dying, dying of scurvy than they were dying in battle, obviously a problem, so he did what we now consider to be one of the first clinical trials, where he took 12 sailors who were in similarly bad shape and randomized them to a variety of treatments, one of them being orange and lemons. So not so surprisingly, the two that got oranges and lemons were back at work in no time. And so he's credited with the one or the first clinical trial. But it took a while to implement this, but that's a whole other story. It's not a KT lecture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that kind of ends our questions today. So thanks again, Catherine and Jennifer, for the presentation of your work and, and answering the audience questions today. And I just would like to give you an opportunity to share some final thoughts before we end today's uh, webinar. Sure. I think um, through this process, we have once again been reminded of the importance of patient engagement in all aspects of our work. 
And we just also want to thank the Canadian Frailty Network for using these priorities that research agenda going forward. And that's all. Yeah, I just want to second Kathy's remarks. It's been really exciting to work with the Canadian Frailty Network and see these, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do is stimulate more research. So having them turned around and this voracious appetite is pretty exciting. So thank you. Mm, thank you. And and uh, just a word out to everybody to watch for this competition that should be coming out in the next month. And, and uh, so that concludes today's webinar. And if you wouldn't mind, please take a minute to complete the, the brief pop-up survey to share your thoughts on today's presentation and provide any feedback to CFN on anything that was discussed or, you know, what we can change going forward in our presentation. And I also hope that um, all of you will register for the next scheduled webinars. And I thank you for attending and submitting questions today. So have a great rest of the day and goodbye for now.